Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. It is like a 2013 flashback today. More news on the corpse of Richard III. Hello, genies. Welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com, America's family history show, where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. So glad you could make it. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth, and I'm always amazed at the stories we run into each and every week around here. When we started the show in 2013, virtually every week there was a new story concerning the battle over the body of King Richard III. It is not every day you find the body of a royal under a parking lot. We'll tell you the latest about that coming up in just a few moments. Our guests this week include Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com. He'll be talking to us about not judging books or odd sources by their covers. And you're going to love the stories from the trail he'll have in his segment coming up in about nine minutes. Then, and I can't even believe I'm saying this, the entire season of Who Do You Think You Are is over. And they had some great episodes this time around. Jen Utley from Ancestry.com will be back to talk about her role in the show this past season and her appearance on the program with Kelsey Grammer. We'll find out how it was working with Frazier himself and what she felt were the highlights of the 2014 edition of Who Do You Think You Are? Then later in the show, Preservation Authority Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com is back to give you a real lesson in how to do a great family interview video. You might be able to actually go to work for Universal Studios after this, so be sure to check it out later in the show. We have a new poll posted now on ExtremeGenes.com. The question this week is, did you know any ancestors who had false teeth? Yes or no? You don't see them much anymore. Both of my grandfathers had false teeth. My dad's dad had a crazy story behind his. In the 1920s, when he was in his 40s, a dentist discovered he had an extra set of teeth. So, he said, the only solution is to pull out your present teeth and let them grow in. So that's what they did. And when they did, they all fell out. So starting in his 40s, Pop Fisher wore false teeth. And by the way, when my dad and then my daughter got those same extra teeth, nobody pulled anything. <laughs> Cast your vote on the survey now at ExtremeGenes.com. Hey, if you have a question or comment you'd like to share with the show or ask of one of our experts, you can always email me at Fisher at ExtremeGenes.com or call our toll-free find line at 1-234-56-GENES. That's 1-234-56-GENES, G-E-N-E-S. The line is open 24-7. You can record your comment or question, and we will be happy to get back to you. It is time once again for your family histoire news from the pages of ExtremeGenes.com. You know, you have to wonder how much information can be extracted from the remains of one individual. But in the case of King Richard III, found under a British parking lot in 2012, the answer seems to be endless. First, we learned DNA and historical circumstances proved his identity. We've learned the truth about his so-called hunched back. It was scoliosis. We now know how many wounds he suffered in his final battle and how he died. We learned he had roundworms. A facial reconstruction based on 3D mappings of his skull was performed so we could know what he looked like. He was a good-looking king. His entire genome is being sequenced because, well, they can do it. And even though he had no children, it's been calculated that millions of us may be collateral relatives to him through his five siblings. What's next? Burial, of course, in Leicester Cathedral, but that's not until next year. In the meantime, his body has revealed more information. 
The British Geological Society and University of Leicester have researched the tooth and bone chemistry of Richard III. As a result, we now know more about his diet at various points in his life, as well as where he lived at certain points in his life. The researchers looked for changes in chemistry in his rib, femur, and teeth, which all develop and rebuild at various times. The geographical info came from isotope measurements that have to do with diet and pollution. His teeth revealed that, yes, Richard had indeed moved from Fothingdale Castle, that's eastern England, before he turned seven. The teeth also showed that he lived where it was rainier, the rocks were older, and his diet was different. I mean, I'm not making this up. The femur study, which covers the period beginning about 15 years before he died, showed he enjoyed a diet associated with the highest aristocracy. The rib part of the study indicated that when he became king, he enjoyed freshwater fish and birds, as well as swan, crane, heron, and egret. Oh, and he really liked wine. It's an amazing story. Check it all out at ExtremeGenes.com. Bloomberg Businessweek reports that by the end of the decade, Greenwood Cemetery, a half million graves strong in Brooklyn, New York, one of New York's largest, will run out of space. That means they're charging more for the remaining plots or mausoleums. Want a 756-square-foot mausoleum? It'll cost you just $320,000. That's with no bedrooms and no bathrooms. Even basic plots are getting out of reach for the average Joe, and Greenwood isn't alone. Many cemeteries in New York are in the same boat. Bloomberg says that the funeral industry as a whole is learning new ways to cash in on our collective demise. Greenwood, for instance, is selling tickets for tours to history lovers. One has to do with the grave of a whiskey distiller of the 19th century. It already sold out at 30 bucks a pop. At nearby Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, where several of my ancestors are buried, they're doing tours inspired by food, including a visit to the grave of Jerry Thomas, an early bartender. Other places are hosting concerts and readings of poetry. There's now a smartphone app for visitors to Arlington Cemetery, so you can find the graves of military vets. In Hong Kong, they found plenty of space for burial, floating off the coast. Yeah, this is a really fun article. Find the link and read all about it at ExtremeGenes.com. And that's your family histoire news for this week. And coming up next, it started with a simple enough find at an estate sale. But amazingly, as is often the case, it turned into genealogical gold. Our friend and research authority Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com will tell you about this family research adventure that happened while researching his own family and give you some thoughts on how to avoid judging a book by its cover when it comes to your research. That's in three minutes on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. America's Family History Show. Your priceless 8mm home movies and your precious family videos are deteriorating right now. Heat, moisture, insects, dust, mold, time, they're all robbing you of your family's memories. It's time to preserve those treasures right now by digitizing them at tmcplace.com. They've been preserving memories for over 40 years. Home movies, videos, audio tapes, vinyl records, photos, slides, and even scrapbooks. Whether your treasures are enduring the humidity of Massachusetts or the heat of Arizona, tmcplace.com can digitize your audio and images without harming the originals and returning them to you with free shipping both ways on most orders. TMCPlace.com can even let you track your package in real time with a special GPS tracking device. Trustworthy, experienced, affordable. Call TMCPlace.com toll-free at 1-866-483-1717 to talk to Extreme Genes Preservation Authority Tom Perry about your project. Or order online at shop.tmcplace.com. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. 
That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Jeans listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Jeans. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. You know, there's nothing more exciting than walking where your ancestors walked and seeing what they saw. Hi, it's Fisher here, and I know I've done it. It's life-changing. And right now, Alan McKay Tours is teaming up with Ancestry Tours for a Great Britain Ancestry Tour. It's happening October 16th through 24th. Fly from your home city to London on October 16th, arriving the morning of the 17th, when you'll enjoy your first day touring England's ancient capital. If you choose, three days out of the trip are dedicated to family history Research with professional experts in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, Scotland. You might have your own agenda in these places, but what an opportunity. Hurry, space is limited for this exciting Great Britain Ancestry Tour, October 16th through 24th. Call Alan McKay Tours today at 801-917-1131. That's 801-917-1131. Prices vary depending upon city of departure. Call now and get a $50 per person Extreme Jeans discount. Here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. And welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, with my good friend Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com. Welcome back, Stan. Good to see you. Thanks, Fish. Great to be here. And every time Stan comes, he's got some bizarre story and interesting stuff. And Bizarre? Well, yes. Harper's, Harper's Bizarre Harper's works. Harper's Bizarre. Yeah. And, and yeah. this week is no exception because uh, we were chatting a little off air and you wanted to talk about unusual places to find your family history. And you've had another one. Yeah, it's kind of the, uh, you know, don't judge a book by its cover kind of a thing. It's and, funny how that works sometimes uh, yeah, in this uh, realm. And and I'm quick to do that, I'm afraid. I've got a second great-grand-uncle, born uh, 1860. My mother knew the man and just adored him. But the pictures that I've seen of him, to be quite frank about it, he looks like a double for Al Capone. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> big round uh, and face. And big, a yeah, big round cigar face. Cigar chomping guy. Well, well, I never saw the cigar, but he's always got a scowl on his face. Mm. And I'm thinking, you know, this is not the guy that I would have wanted to raid his apple trees or something. Right. You know? They find you under the apple trees. Yeah, buried some one of the two, you know, or in the mash pit or something. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I was digging around in my family history a couple months ago, prior to my mother's birthday, trying to find something for her. And I came across an obituary for William H. Pyle, Belvedere, Illinois, and a grand and glorious obituary, as all obituaries seem to be. I, I have yet to read about a scoundrel in an obituary. <laughs> no, they were all fantastically yeah, well-loved people, yeah, no matter yeah, what. Yeah, they, all saints, every one of them, bless their hearts. At any rate, I find this obituary, and in the obituary, there's a reference to an article, a full-page article that had been published in the Saturday Evening Post. Wow. Which, for you and I, yes. and many people in the audience, Saturday Evening Post was big time. Big time for a long uh, time. This was, and They're this gone was, now, though. Uh, no, they are actually still around. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I know because I spoke with them. Oh, okay. Um, either that or I've become clairvoyant mm -hmm. at any rate. So I thought this would be great. Nobody knows about this. Nobody that's living in my family knows about this. And since my mother loved this guy, I will see if I can get it. Well, I dug and I dug and I dug and I dug. Said several years before his death. Well, that didn't What mean does that mean? Yeah, exactly. It doesn't mean two years. Does it mean five um, at any rate? So finally, after not being able to find it, I got online and I found a phone number for the Saturday Evening Post. And I called and got this fine young lady, I believe she's from Romania. But she was enthralled by this whole thing and she took it upon herself to start digging. And after a few days, she contacted me and she said, I found it. Wow. And sure enough, here is this wonderful picture of this man. Uncle Bill. Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy. Hmm which harkens back to a movie, I think. Um, you know, it's a wonderful life kind of a right, thing. Right, yeah. 
At any rate, this Uncle Billy was out in front of his store with probably 45 employees. And as it turns out, on the far right of the picture was my second great-grandmother, whom I had never seen a picture of. I found this out after I sent it off to my mother. But in the article, it talks about Uncle Billy in the early 1900s in a town of 7,000 people earning over almost a million dollars. I can't remember the Whoa. exact number. A year. Wow. Okay. Um, he would sell so much merchandise. He would order flour and the sugar and the coffee by the boxcar load. And he would sell two boxcar loads a month. But there were people coming from 30, 40 miles around to his store. Across the street from his store and immediately next door to him were two other grocery stores. They were chain stores. And when Uncle Billy died, the article talks about how the entire town shut down. Even the competition closed their doors so that everyone could go to Uncle Billy's funeral. They um, said that... (laughs) What what year was this? This was in 1939 when he died. And they said that there were so many people that they could have filled the church four times. They were standing around outside and they had like town criers who were yelling out the funeral (laughs) services to the crowd outside. Hey, that's the kind of funeral I want. Yeah. That's awesome. I thought it's a good thing he wasn't Irish or the wake would have sunk the entire county. Right. Right. So looking at Uncle Billy's picture, really... I did him disservice. Obviously, he was a well-loved man. I had another experience some years ago. Well, let me ask you before you oh, go. Yeah. Before you go anywhere with that, did you get an original of this, or did they send you a scan? They sent me a. Well, they didn't send an original. They had the means to send the like a, a galley copy. Oh. And it, the thing was huge. I mean, it was like thirty-five inches tall and. Like something you're going to put up for the circus coming to town. Because I was going to say, if the, if you only got a scan, you could easily go on eBay and set it up so that basically right. you would get a, an email if one right. of those from that issue became available. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. I hadn't even thought about it. That, I think that'd be terrific. I know my mother would love to see the actual magazine yeah. you know, with the other articles that were surrounding it. You, you had a magazine story. For yeah, you. I did. Actually, back in 06, I had a third cousin I had been in touch with over the years. And he said, hey, there's this New York magazine that I just love, and it came in and it has this photograph of an apartment at the Dakota. You know, this is where John Lennon died in New York City. And it features this incredibly ornate, gorgeous bookcase that had been built in 1829 and signed underneath one of the bookshelves, Robert Fisher, 1829. He said, could this be our Robert Fisher? And I said, well, he was a cabinet maker, and he was there in 1829, and he was the only one. So, yeah, that's our guy. Wow. And so, eventually, I did wind up getting an original magazine of that with it featured. It was Leonard Bernstein's former apartment, and then the people who bought it after he passed away had the bookcase. And as a result of that, we learned that it had actually been displayed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art back in 2000, 2001. As a prominent piece of furniture? They were, they were showing furniture as art from that particular era in New York City, and they had a few of these, and, and that was one of the featured pieces. Wow. That's, so, that's amazing. It, it is. I, I love Who it. would ever know that you could yeah. find something like that relating to your yeah. family, yeah. like you say, in a magazine? Yeah, it, it's incredible. Follow the leads. That, yeah, all the way out. All Follow. the way. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah. you, you don't just blow past something in an obituary. That's right. If there's a little clue, chase it. You're going to have fun. I always maintain if you can give me just a little bit of fur at the end of the cat's tail— I can bring in the whole cat. I'll let you have it. I'm allergic (laughs) to cats. There are other rather unique places where you can find information, again, by not judging the book by its cover. Some years ago, I bought in an estate sale back in Rochelle, Illinois, a cookbook that was published in the 1890s. And the recipes were wonderful. I, I like cooking. And so that was why I bought it. And it had the surname of one of my step-grandparents' families. Hmm. And I thought, well, maybe they're related. What do you mean it had it? It was the the author? or No, no, no. Inside of the front cover was the surname. It was Mrs. Vogel is what it was. Okay, so somebody somebody had written it in there. That was was the owner. Exactly, as the owner. And so I bought it. And I'm reading through it and, you know, loving these recipes. Then I stumbled across several items that were stuck within the book. There were small pieces of paper that had recipes handwritten, 
And on these recipes, it would say Aunt Tilly or Cousin Matilda or Sister Betty Sorensen or whatever. And some of these names I kind of recognized as being family names, but others I did not know. And by following out and doing research, I discovered that some of these people were women who were sisters to my step-great-grandmother. And I had no idea that they even existed. So not only did I have their given name, but I had their married name now, and thereby was able to expand the family tremendously. Also stuck in the book was a tremendous page that was torn out of a magazine. It was instructions for women for traveling on the trains of the day. And we're talking about coal-fired trains. And, you know, we see in the movies these grand and glorious outfits that these women wore. Well, it was a great way to start a fire because the cinders would blow back and it was hotter than get out in the train cars. So they'd have the windows open. And so these cinders would fly in and land on these really frilly dresses. And oh, no. (laughs) Yeah. So they were advised not to wear this stuff, you know, and to buy a rain slicker to wear while you're on the train. And I'm thinking... Let's see, 90 degrees, 95% humidity, and a rain slicker. Wow. Oh, yeah, I want to be riding on this train. The good old days. Not quite like the movies, huh? (laughs) No. So my point here is look at all those old weird things, you know. If you have even a spark of an interest in a book that you see in an estate sale or in your grandmother's house or something, pick the thing up. There may be notes in there if you like it. Chances are grandma liked it or she wouldn't have had it on her shelf to begin with. And back then they made notes in those things. And so you can find all kinds of wonderful things. And this really harkens back to our visit with Joy from JustAJoy.com, the website where basically you put in the surnames that you're looking for. And as antique dealers and other people stumble upon things that relate to old families, you might be able to acquire that from family Bibles to whatever, old photographs. Yes, and I exhort you that even if when you buy something, it doesn't have something about your family, put the information out there. It applies to somebody's family, and they may not even know they're looking for it yet, but the day will come when one of them will go, oh, that looks like it belongs to my family. And the joy that you had in finding things about your great-grandparents or your great-great-uncle can be shared with so many people. Pay it forward. That's right. Over and over and over again. All right. Great advice. Great stories from Stan Lindis, as always, from HeritageConsulting.com. Good to see you again, Stan. Thanks for dropping by. Thanks, Fish. And coming up next, she researched for Who Do You Think You Are and actually appeared on a show this past season. We'll talk to Jen Utley from Ancestry.com coming up next in five minutes on Extreme Genes. Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. Hello, Extreme Jeans listeners. I'm Larry Gelwix, the getaway guru and host of the Travel Show radio broadcast with the hottest travel deals on the planet. And now you can travel more and pay less by joining me on our Travel Show podcast. Cruises, tours, resort hotels, airline tickets, stay close to home or travel the world. I'll show you how to travel more and pay less. Go online to columbusvacations.com. That's columbusvacations.com. Click on radio. And then click on podcast. It's really that simple. ColumbusVacations.com, radio and podcast for the hottest travel deals on the planet. Got a brick wall in your family tree? Don't know how to break through it? Get professional help from Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services. Speak directly with an experienced genealogical researcher, not a salesperson, by calling toll-free 1-877-537-2000. When you call, ask how you could win a free one-hour consultation with an expert genealogist. Heritage Consulting Genealogy Research Services with over 35 years of research experience. Visit heritageconsulting.com. Did you know your family's memories are being destroyed a little at a time every day? It's true. Old home movies, slides, photos, and audio recordings fade over time. The longer you delay the digitizing of these priceless artifacts, the more likely it is they'll be gone one day. That's why you need to call the Multimedia Center. I brought in VHS videotape and had them transferred to DVD. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transferduplication.com. (laughs) 
Hey, you found us. It's Extreme Genes Family History Radio, ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, with Jennifer Utley, our good friend from Ancestry.com, and one of the researchers for Who Do You Think You Are? And, Jen, I can't believe the season's over already. How does that happen? I know. I, it went really fast this year. Yeah, I mean, there were only like six episodes. Isn't that like the shortest year ever? It could be. It could be, yeah. Okay. Well, why is that? You know, usually there are more people on the docket, but sometimes we lose people due to scheduling conflicts. Oh, okay. So they become superheroes. They get the big movie shot. Exactly. That happens every now and then. Exactly. And you were actually on an episode this year yourself. I mean, I remember last year you were telling us about emailing with one of the stars and you became a hero with your kids. And this had to send them just through the roof to have you actually on the show. You know, I think he was more impressed last year than he was this year. (laughs) (laughs) How come? Why do you think? Well, so the person I got to uh, email back and forth with last year was Jim Parsons. Right. And he is a big Jim Parsons fan. Mm -hmm. I think he got pretty excited when he realized that Kelsey Grammer, who I got to meet this year, was in the X-Men movies. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's talk about the season. It was only six episodes here. And what was your involvement with it all? I manage the research teams from the Ancestry side. Uh, There are two teams. There's an Ancestry side and a Shed side, and I get to manage that research from the Ancestry side. All right. Now, what was the other side you mentioned? So we work with the production company, and they have a team of researchers as well. Okay. Now, how does that work? Well, we make sure that we talk a lot. We have weekly meetings and we communicate, and the best thing we do is we take really detailed notes and keep task lists so we can divide and conquer the research work. Right, because it's got to go pretty quickly to do an entire season, doesn't it? It does, though it does take between six to nine months to finish a tree. So you're already starting on next year. We would like to. (laughs) (laughs) If you knew who was going to be on it. That's right, and the faster we can know who's going to be on it, the sooner we can jump right in. Exactly. All right, Well, so what was your favorite episode this year? Um, My favorite episode to watch was probably the Cynthia Nixon episode. Um, That was right at the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the first one this season, and it really resonated. I mean, we found an amazing story of this woman, uh, Cynthia's great-great-great-grandmother, who was, who we found her in jail. That's right. I remember in Missouri, right? That's right. And she had uh, actually killed her husband with an axe which sounds really terrible until we actually found uh, there was a newspaper account that talks that she talked to a neighbor and her husband had pretty much said to her, make sure you say your prayers today because you're not going to live to see the sun go down. And at that point, she had to make a choice. She had children and she chose that she was going to survive and he wasn't going to. Wow. Well, it's someone who was facing hard times and took matters into their own hands. And as a result, she ended up at the Missouri Penitentiary. At at the time, she was only the second woman ever sent there. Unbelievable. Now, by the way, just for people to understand, the series is over as of this past Wednesday. But you can see the entire series again, and it's a great way to do it, you know, just to spend a nice Saturday or Sunday or something watching all the episodes. They're available. Was it TLC.com, Jennifer? Yeah, TLC.com has full episodes that are streaming online for free. And if you want to own them, I've seen them there at iTunes for download, too. Oh, that's great. Okay, so let's talk about the Kelsey Grammer episode, because you were actually on it and and actually worked with him. You, You got to meet him, I assume. Yeah, this is the first time I was asked to be on the show. It was kind of exciting. And what was that experience like? Because I hear he's a pretty good guy. He is. And I'll tell you a quick story about when I first met him. I walked up to him, and I I always introduce myself as Jennifer, because Jennifer's easier to explain, uh, because I go by Jen. And I said, hi, I'm Jennifer. He turned to me and says, no, you're Jen with two N's. And I spell my name, Jen, with two N's. And he had paid attention to his briefing documents so much that he knew that I wasn't just Jennifer. I was Jen with two N's. And that was really indicative of how professional he was the whole time. Like, he knew the, the names of everyone on the crew, called everyone by name. I really felt like I was working with a someone, a real professional who knew what they were doing. Isn't that something? And he enjoyed the process, I assume, and all the things he learned? I think so. I don't think he knew what to expect. He says later on the episode that he thought he came from a small family. And if you know anything about Kelsey's background, he has gone through real tragedy in his life. right. And the first half of his episode is kind of sad because he saw some of his ancestors who went through some hard times and maybe didn't make the right decisions as they went. But I think that 
he really got something from that in learning about their stories. But as he went further back, he came across people who walked the Oregon Trail and came from Illinois all the way to Oregon with 12 children in hopes of being able to claim some land of their own. So I think ultimately it was pretty inspiring for him. Well, and, and certainly now he knows that he's probably doesn't have a really small family. He has tons and tons of cousins out there. And that's right. And so how did he react to this? Because he's a very emotional guy. He is. And, you know, the other thing is he's super well-spoken. He's really eloquent. I saw him on an interview two weeks ago where he was quoting Chekhov. But there's a part at the end of his episode where he's really summing it all up. And he says something like that there's all these names that are kind of alive and flickering in his imagination. And it was really the way he summed up how... He feels a a sense of connection to these people. The first time I watched the episode, I actually went back and rewatched his summing up of the episode like five or six times because it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, I I bet it was. And then that's really part of the fun, isn't it, is seeing people internalize all this new information. This is what we all enjoy doing in family history. Well, that's the best part about family history. I think learning that people had hardships, too, it's strengthening for us today. So what part of Kelsey Grammer's family tree did you help discover? I was actually the first expert that he met along the way. So it was my job to take the questions that he had about his grandma, who he calls Gam in the episode, and kind of introduce him to her family. So we sat down and we found her in the 1910 census and the 1920 census. And then uh, he didn't know the name of his great-great-grandfather. So we used some newspaper records, which pointed us in that direction. And from there, he had the names and dates and places that he had so he could continue on with his journey. Now, has he done any of his own research? I don't believe that he'd done any at all. It seems to me a lot of these celebrities now are starting to talk with one another and saying, hey, you've got to go on this show. You've got to have this experience. Are you seeing some of that or hearing that? Oh, of course we are. So in the in the first seasons, we had to approach celebrities, and in some cases we did some mini trees to get them excited about what we could find. But these days, we're really finding that the celebrities are talking to one another, you know, colleagues that they've worked on shows or movies with. And honestly, there are a lot of people coming to us because they want to be part of it. Now, you say you have no names for next year, but you might be working on something because I know how you are. You hold back. You've never told me everything, Jen. And we've had a long <laughs> relationship here now. That's right. You know, That's now job, though. <laughs> you're working on something next year. You must be. You know, we're always working on something. And, and even when it's just finishing up some of the names that we didn't finish in time for this season, we're always moving forward. All right. Now, did you get an autograph from Kelsey, by the way, for your son? I tried really hard not to be too nerdy and too fangirl with Kelsey, <laughs> but I was a fan. Like, I've seen all of the Fazers and all the cheers, and I, I think he's really terrific. So I did take, I took an extra census record with me, and I asked him to sign it, which he was more than happy to sign for me. Well, that's nice. You got it framed with a picture somewhere. There must be a photo with you, too. Uh, I do have a small little photo on my phone <laughs> that I pull out when people really want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, congratulations, Jen, on another great season. It's on TLC.com. People can watch it whenever they want. There will be another season next year, I assume? I sure hope so. I haven't heard any announcements, but that's what we're all hoping for. All right. She's Jennifer Utley. She's family historian at Ancestry.com, works on Who Do You Think You Are. Thanks for joining us again, Jen, with two N's. Happy to be here. Thanks. And coming up next, it's Tom Perry from TMZPlace.com with some more great ideas for preserving and sharing your past. Next, on Extreme Genes Family History Radio and ExtremeGenes.com. You know, when it comes to family history, there's nothing quite like the thrill of the hunt and the excitement generated by every new discovery. Who were your immigrant ancestors? What ship did they come over on? Why did they come when they did? Did they participate in any military campaigns that took place in their day? What personal challenges did your forefathers and mothers endure? Heritage Consulting, genealogy research services can get you the answers to many of these questions and more. They've been providing professional research and consultation services since 1970. 
1-877-537-2000. That's 1-877-537-2000. Call toll-free 1-877-537-2000 to speak directly to a professional family history researcher. Heritage Consulting can research, collect, analyze, and interpret the countless documents your ancestors generated throughout their lives and present the findings to you in an attractive book or in an electronic format. The cost? Far less than you'd expect for far more than you can imagine. 877-537-2000 or go to heritageconsulting.com. While we all love diving into the deep end of our gene pool, don't forget about capturing the histories of those who are still with us. Go to StoryWorth.com to start your family's story today. Each week, StoryWorth.com will email a question to people whose stories you wish to preserve. Questions like, tell us about the day you got engaged, or what do you remember about your grandmother? All they have to do is reply with a story, either by email or by telephone. That story is then forwarded to the family and securely stored in a private online storybook. It doesn't get any simpler. You can enroll up to six storytellers for, get this, just $49 a year. You'll get a free one-month trial. And for a limited time, Extreme Genes listeners get an additional 10% discount at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. That's StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Is your family story worth 13 cents a day? Sign up now at StoryWorth.com slash Extreme Genes. Simple, secure, effective. Your story is worth telling. You know, there's nothing more exciting than walking where your ancestors walked and seeing what they saw. Hi, it's Fisher here, and I know I've done it. It's life-changing. And right now, Alan McKay Tours is teaming up with Ancestry Tours for a Great Britain Ancestry Tour. It's happening October 16th through 24th. Fly from your home city to London on October 16th, arriving the morning of the 17th, when you'll enjoy your first day touring England's ancient capital. If you choose, three days out of the trip are dedicated to family history Research with professional experts in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and Edinburgh, Scotland. You might have your own agenda in these places, but what an opportunity. Hurry, space is limited for this exciting Great Britain Ancestry Tour, October 16th through 24th. Call Alan McKay Tours today at 801-917-1131. That's 801-917-1131. Prices vary depending upon city of departure. Call now and get a $50 per person Extreme Jeans discount. Here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. Welcome back to Extreme Genes Family History Radio, America's family history show. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. He's Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, the Preservation Authority. How you doing, Tom? Tanned and ready to rock and roll. All right. We got uh, an email sent to asktom at tmcplace.com from Jeff Dooley in Houston, Texas. He said, Tom, thanks for the tips on shooting video about framing and lighting, but I'm having trouble keeping track of all the times I turn the camera on and off and where I find stuff. Is there a way to deal with this? Oh, absolutely. One of the methods I really try and hammer across in the videography class I teach, first thing is whenever you're starting a new shoot, whether you're using tape or a hard disk drive or an SD card or whatever, I suggest you slate your video by laying down 10 to 30 seconds of black for a pre-roll in order to edit. So you're probably going, well, what's a slate? Yeah, Well, yeah, slate and pre-roll. Talk about that. What's that? Everybody that's watched a movie, how they make a movie, they see the little clapboard that they call them. They go, clap like that, and it shows the numbers going across and says what the name of the video is. Most people don't have that opportunity. So what I suggest you do is most cameras now have what they call color bars. You can go and flip on your color bars which are like in the old days, you'd see the color bars at the beginning of shows, and lay that down about 10 to 15 seconds. And while you're laying that down, say, hey, this is January 14, 2020, and we're going to be interviewing grandma. So you've done what we call slating it. Now, this does two things. Not only does it help you keep track of where your uh, cuts and edits are, it gives you some time to pre-roll. We have people coming in that they start shooting a movie instantly, whether it's a music video or whatever that isn't experienced, and then they want something that first five seconds on the tape. You can't do that. The camera has to get up to speed before the editors can kick in and you can start editing. So if you don't have any pre-roll, basically your first 10 seconds that you shot are of no value. You can't use them in really? any way. I had no idea. Oh, absolutely. So that's why I say open up the color bars. Another good thing about the color bars is you might go out and shoot this same segment like three different times on three different days. And you get into Adobe Premiere or whatever program you're using and you're going... My colors don't look the same. By having color bars, which are always the same, when you're editing them, you can set them up. Then when you do the next shot, 
go and adjust your colors to match the color bars that are permanently set again. And when you do that on every scene, you can edit from different days, different times, and all the colors are going to look the same. It's not going to be this truck one time looks kind of off red, the next time it looks bright red, the next time it kind of looks pink. It lets you set up your color editor so all the colors will be consistent through your edit. Boy, that's great advice. Oh, it helps a ton. And then after the color bars, either just put your camera lens on so it's black, if it totally covers your lens, or go to a black section and lay down about 10 seconds of black too, so that gives you that much more pre-roll before you start. And then another thing that I really like to do is if you're shooting grandma and grandpa and want to take a break for lunch or something like that, lay down some black again. And then you can say, you know, this is segment two. So if you're not changing your scenes or anything, you don't need to lay down color bars every single time, but lay down a black slate with you talking, saying, we're going to be interviewing grandma and grandpa. This is section two, you know, take three or whatever. And then when you're going back and searching through it on your computer, you find these black areas are really easy to find. Oh, here's a black area. Then you listen to it and say, oh, this is segment two. Oh, well, I'm looking for segment one. So you fast forward it. So you're not sitting there listening to the interview, going back and forth, thinking, did they talk about the green herring before they were talking about the red house or which one was first? You have all these black sections that are really fast and easy to find. Because on most editing programs, you'll have the thumbnails up on the top of your yes. screen. So you see, oh, there's black. That's the beginning of a segment. Take your cursor back there, and you can listen to what your title is. Go to the next one and find out what segment you want. Because a lot of times when people are telling stories, they tell them out of order. And so this way you can say, okay, I want to start with segment three, then go back to segment one, then go to segment two. And they're just so easy to find when you've laid down these sections of black. All right, that's great advice. And uh, thanks for the question, Jeff. And once again, if you have a question for Tom, you can always ask Tom at tmcplace.com. And when we return in three minutes, what are we going to talk about? Some more video tips to make your video look better and more consistent. On Extreme Genes, Family History Radio and extremegenes.com. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Com. Hello, Extreme Jeans listeners. I'm Larry Gelwix, the getaway guru and host of the Travel Show radio broadcast with the hottest travel deals on the planet. And now you can travel more and pay less by joining me on our Travel Show podcast. Cruises, tours, resort hotels, airline tickets, stay close to home or travel the world. I'll show you how to travel more and pay less. Go online to columbusvacations.com. That's columbusvacations.com. Click on radio. Video and then click on podcast. It's really that simple. ColumbusVacations.com, radio and podcast for the hottest travel deals on the planet. You have found us, Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, America's Family History Show. Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is the Preservation Authority. Tom, we've been talking a lot about the interview process. This is a great thing to do. Obviously, the older your folks are, the less time they have, no matter what. You know, we all have less time as we get older. But exactly. when they get up there, you better get on it. Because as we've often quoted, when somebody dies, a library is burned. Exactly. And uh, one of the things that I think is important in this process of preservation is editing. And a lot more people now are doing their own editing. They're comfortable on computers. And, and if they're not, they can certainly learn from people like you or someplace in the neighborhood, which will offer a course in video editing. But there have got to be some important tips to this. There are such great tips out there to help people. So many people out there doing it themselves. Like I remember back when I used to do music videos and professional stuff. It was like a 60-gigabyte system with like $30,000. <laughs> That's right. You know, it was you, just crazy. You, oh, nobody could afford that. It was all professional. Oh, it was, totally. In fact, you can go buy a MacBook Pro now or even an Air Mac for just over $1,000. It has all the editing equipment you need. It has a solid-state hard drive in it. It's just absolutely incredible what you can do for under two grand now. It's amazing. If you make bad videos, people aren't going to watch them. So part of preserving is not just having the stuff there, but having them so people are going to enjoy them. They're going to want to watch them. 
And editing is one of the biggest things that a lot of people don't understand and can make some major mistakes. Like we talked in the earlier segment about laying down 5 to 10 seconds of black. That helps you avoid what we call in the industry a jump cut. So basically what a jump cut is, if you're shooting Ronnie running across your screen from the right to the left and you all of a sudden cut to another frame and he's running the other direction, it's like, whoa, how did he start going that direction? And it's jarring and it doesn't make sense. But if you have black where you can fade to black and then fade back up from black, then it doesn't you know, have that jump cut. Plus you can kind of what we call cheat a little bit, like take some time out, like the, your kids are on a skateboard or whatever. You can take these things out so it doesn't look like it's so long. Or grandma talking about, you know, the red truck that she grew up in, and she just keeps going and talking about all these things that are of no value. If you fade to black and then fade back up to grandma, you can take out that 10 minutes of gobbledygook, so to speak, but it feels natural. It doesn't look like something was just cut out. Another thing that's really important to know is when you're shooting, you want your colors to look good. Like if you've ever watched some TV news shows and they're filming somebody inside of a building and you can see a window, and the window looks blue, and you're going, why does the window look blue? Well, basically, light to us looks white, but to a camera, it sees what the true colors are, and outside, things are blue. So if we're shooting something inside, and we want to show the panorama mountains in the background or whatever, what we would do is we would set up a few lights, which we talked about about three or four weeks ago, and we'd put what's called a blue gel in front of them, which you can pick up really cheap at any you know theater store. And so we'd make everything blue, then we would go and turn our white balance on our camera to manual, get a white piece of paper that now looks blue to us, and tell the camera, this is white. And then you would manually white balance, then everything you shoot is going to look perfect. The new cameras that do white balance automatically, it's amazing what they do. For instance, if you're shooting in grandma's basement and she's got really old fluorescent lights, they're going to look green. And everybody's going to have this pasty green look to their face. <laughs> so what you want to do is get a white piece of paper and hold it up in front of grandma or a white wall or anything. If you're shooting outside a white car, push in on it really tight, or as they call it nowadays, zoom in on it really tight and set the manual white balance. So what that's going to do is that's going to tell the camera, hey, this light green is really supposed to be white. You know what you're telling me is we got to learn our cameras a little bit more than we generally do. Exactly. Because afterwards, it's very difficult to correct. Oh, very difficult, time-consuming, and expensive if you hire somebody else to do it for you. All right. Thanks for joining us, Tom. I just love sharing these tips. And if anybody has questions, you know, you can email me at any time at asktom at tmcplace.com. And I'll get back to you just as soon as possible and maybe read your questions on the air. Thank you, Tomas. And thank you also to Stan Lindis from HeritageConsulting.com, Jen Utley from Ancestry.com, talking about who do you think you are. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.